Okay. Back to the fairy tale. <laughs> and as you can see, the economists for this country, they did exactly what we learned. They know what the modern cost is, equal to average cost. They have the demand curve not follows it. They find the modern revenue curve not follows it. They find exactly where the modern revenue curve intersects with the modern cost curve. And that is where we have Q cheat. So they have learned, as you have learned, to maximize profit. Q cheat. Ending up in the new price level, P cheat, that was marginally lower, so that the rest of the cartel members didn't mind. Okay. Maybe he has cheated, maybe not. We don't know. And suddenly, they see the castle. And suddenly, they see two castles. And then they say, hmm, where did you get the money from? And they can conclude for themselves. And then they start saying, thinking, well, now we cheat too. And so suddenly, they all start cheating. What happens? The price level falls dramatically. The total volume increases. And they all end up with lower income, selling more oil, <coughs> and since the cartel doesn't work anymore, it is a bad strategy. So once one member started, that was the first move. If there will be any counter moves, then all of them will lose. But every time they just try and are very tempted, <coughs> but if it happens, and it happens now and then, then OPEC as an organization, and OPEC has done that several times, just respond by increasing quantity, playing tit for tat, saying that if you don't keep to the contract, we play tit for tat. If you go back, we still play tit for tat. So OPEC can be a tit for tat player. And therefore, they can succeed in the long run to keep the cartel if they have very good systems to observe that none of the players cheat. So what they actually has done is to develop simple systems to observe whether any of the players try to cheat. And that is not easy anymore. You know, we have all these satellites. OPEC will be there watching you. <laughs> they say to all these members, we'll be watching you. And every tanker meeting in country will be registered up there from the satellite. And therefore, since it's not easy to cheat, it's not easy to move along the D not fellowship. So the 
this was the next reason for keeping the cartel going, keeping collusion solution when playing tit for tat. Doing that regularly, they just by developing better system to observe cheaters, they have no. <coughs> now ended up with a cartel that had lasted for many decades. <coughs> it was established during the, the 70s, 1970, and it had lasted since then. And I think there are reasons to say that the open cartel has been a success. Next one. Then we move into retailing. Now we have a new model. We are going to look at two retailing companies, Sears and Walmart. And the simple question is, if they have different costs, and if they have exactly the same products, so they sell all the same products, the only difference is that Walmart has a more efficient logistical system. So Walmart is more cost effective. So they have different cost functions, but they have exactly the same demand function because no product differentiation. And they have fixed cost. And the fixed cost is 150. And we then look at the figure. Next one. This is how the market looks like. The demand function. for one of the players. <coughs> and that is the same for each of them. <laughs> and you see, for every quantity, Walmart is more cost efficient. That is the black dotted line. One series is less cost efficient. And if we add these two cost, modern cost curves, we get, <coughs> add them horizontally, we get the red line, where the modern cost is 45 plus Q for Q higher than 5. Then the question is, what will be the solution? to this market. As all players out there, they find the twice as steep curve, that is the modern revenue curve, and they look for the market solution if <coughs> they have played as one player. And if they play as one player, the modern cost is equal to the modern revenue, where the quantity is 27.5. And <coughs> the price level, 86.25. If they succeed to collude, and that's where we start, 
we say that let us assume that they have one cost efficient and one less cost efficient, <coughs> but still they maximize the, t the profit <coughs> and share that, producing 27.5 and the price level 86.25. And <coughs> we will have to that model revenue that <coughs> Walmart will produce 16.25 and Sears 11.25. So the most cost efficient will produce more. since modern cost equal to modern revenue. That's where we start. But then we have an incentive problem. Why come? Next picture. Here is where Walmart, the bigger one, <coughs> has its own demand curve, its own modern revenue curve, its own average cost. <coughs> and the average cost curve is U-shaped since we have fixed cost. And we have modern cost starting at 40. <coughs> and we have modern cost Modern revenue, mo <coughs> modern revenue equal to modern cost exactly where we have quantity 15 and price level 85. So Walmart has to accept a price level that is somewhat higher. And definitely have an incentive to give discounts down to 85. Why come? Because the price level 85 <coughs> will increase the quantity from 12 and a half to 15 and will increase profit. So the most cost efficient have an incentive to cheat. Can you see that? When the modern revenue curve intersects in the modern cost curve, that is 70, 15, and the price level, 85. <coughs> Why come they don't do it? <coughs> they run the risk, next picture, that Sears. is willing to start a price war. If Walmart starts, then Sears can just answer. And if you look at Sears as a profit maximizing company, their profit will be enhanced <coughs> if the price level 
was 87.5 and little bit higher with a volume 12.5 so they want a little bit higher price and a little bit lower volume but if now Sears Walmart starts to go down to 85 how far can now Sears go without losing money and <laughs> down to how far well <coughs> where see is exactly cover its total cost <coughs> where's that Sears has its own demand curve that intersects with the average co cost curve when the price level 78.5 that's where they exactly cover their own total costs by selling 21.5 and since Walmart will know that has Walmart any incentive to start that price war because Walmart will know that if I go to 85 and if Sears don't like that Sears can punish us going all the way down to 78.5 and even though we earn a little bit since we are more efficient we don't like prices to be that low so this is one way that they know that even though the prices are different and Walmart has incentives to reduce their prices to capture a higher market share in the long run they can keep on colluding even though the cost structure is different because Walmart will know that if I start Sears can play tit for tat and I have a go to move and Sears moves and since we are not any good friends anymore we don't trust each other we keep on moving and since we are aggressive we move all the way down to 78.5 <coughs> Any further, will not <coughs> Sears be willing to go because then Sears will lose money. So we can see that with different cost structure, there is an incentive to break the collusion, but still. the incentives can be stopped because of the time dimension that in the long run this can easily bring us into a price war <coughs> next one <coughs> then we go into a different market and now we ask ourselves how easy is it 
to go on colluding if the cost structure is quite the same, but we have differentiated products. So now we have a different model, exactly the same cost structure, but different demand function. The willingness to pay for Coke that we have in this figure is higher than the willingness to pay for 7-Up. <coughs> and again, we look for where the modern cost is equal to modern revenue, ending up in 15, price level 85. And this is the solution for Coke where the modern revenue curve intersects with the modern cost curve. And you can easily see <coughs> that this gives <coughs> good profit <coughs> for Coke. <coughs> Next one. <coughs> and this is seven up. <coughs> Now, the price level is 80, quantity is 10, so there is definitely an incentive to reduce prices because of higher, lower quality, and a demand function with a lower willingness to pay. And to conclude here, another topic, when the two players play product differentiation and the products, and they manage to change the demand function, since Coke is the winner, by advertising, by R&D, by market power, they have a demand function that moves outwards. And they take advantage of that by putting the prices high. And 7up would very much want to have the, the same prices but they will end up with prices much lower. <coughs> but if these two companies have agreed to collaborate, collaborate totally, they could have gained a higher profit. But since they have incentives to cheat, it is very difficult to keep that kind of pollution going. <coughs> so a strategy, product differentiation, always leads to companies being not able to collude as easy as in different other markets. Product differentiation is a very, very important strategy, but it easily leads to no collusion. And the winner is always the winner in the market. The one with the demand function with the highest willingness to pay. Okay, next one. This is the kind of summary. <coughs> there are many factors that have impacts on the ease of collusion. We have 
have gone through some of them. And <coughs> if we have a market where it isn't very easy to enter, high entry barriers. And there are many reasons for entry barriers. It can be high fixed cost, it can be patents, it can be high advertising costs. And if that is a characteristic of the market, high entry barriers. then it's easier to succeed <laughs> to collude. So that is one. Number two. We have already discussed it. If the technology is easy to understand, <coughs> and all the companies have the same technology, then it's easier to go. Third, if there will be close to homogeneous products, no product differentiation, then the more the closer you are to a homogeneous product, the easier you manage to collude. And then it's about contracting. <coughs> the smaller the number of firms, the easier it is to contract and to collude. <coughs> So many companies makes it more difficult to collude. <laughs> and five, what's meant with concentration? If there will be one leader and many small followers, if you have just one leader, then we have that simple model price leaner and it's easier to collude. You end up in a price leaner that just drives the price level to a high level and all the fins they just adopt that price level as price takers. And Number six, if we have a slow rate of technological advance, it's a quite stable market, no revolutions. You don't need to just look at your rival, try to understand whether he will come up with a brand new product that will take over the whole market because it's stable. It's not like in electronics. So this is the kind of market with no very high R&D innovation factor. It is aluminum. Aluminum is aluminum is aluminum. And you can change the technology to be more cost efficient, to be more climate friendly, but you don't really change aluminium into magnesium. It is aluminium. Seven. If there is a steady state of growth, growth steadily, you just sit there. And every year, your market growth 3%. And it has done that for hundreds of years. And you just uh, sit and wait for next year. 
and you go to your board and say we probably will e will reach our goal next year, 3% growth. Then it's easier to pollute. If it's moving downwards, it's difficult to pollute. Because if there will be a market that breaks down, it's survival of the fittest. Then it's not easy to pollute. No elasticity of demand. That is about market power. If the elasticity of demand is very high, in the meaning that if you increase your price, the customer leaves you. You don't have much market power. That is where it's difficult to pollute. The lower the elasticity of demand, the more market power you have, the customers will keep to your product even though you increase your price. And you have so much market power that you have a very stable market. You can easily use your market power and you can gain a high profit. And that's the kind of market that is open for pollution. And finally, number nine, no frequency of sales. If you sell many, many times, it's not that easy to pollute. But if it happens just now, and then, like this ferry market, where you have competitive tendering, but it's not every week. It is competitive tendering when in your market, maybe every second, third year. When it's low frequency of sales, there are strong incentives to pollute. And it's easier to just keep the pollution going. I once gave this topic to the final exam. And it was up to you to remember this table and all the models connected to it. And I think the students felt that this was not the kind of difficult exercise. I think they felt that this was easy. And I think it is, because it's obvious if you go through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, it's so obvious. And if you remember some of the models, the cartel model, the Walmart model, the Coca-Cola model, and the tit for tap and grim strategy model, If you just remember that, you were saved. Next one. Finally. This is a marketplace where none of us like to be. That is where average cost is quite high and demand does not intersect with the average cost curve. And definitely 
you don't like that. Let's now imagine that we are in a marketplace where <laughs> there are two players and they start by colluding ending up in 5.11 C2 and the deficit when V P1 A B C1 can you see that? the demand is Q1 average cost you find that in point B for each unit you sell, you lose the distance AB, and that gray area ABC1P1 is what you lose. In this market, of course, the players don't like to stay here and they want one to be driven out of the marketplace <coughs> if one will be driven out the demand left for the other will be high enough to cover average cost since that might not happen voluntarily none of the players are willing to give up you can start what you call good throughout competition as, as a player you just maximize your own profit going down to Q1 when your modern cost curve intersects with the modern revenue curve suddenly I mean suddenly you play the price war. Since you don't cover the fixed cost at the level P1, you say that no, I'm very aggressive. I go all the way down to P2. Price equal to modern cost. I don't cover any of my fixed costs. And I hope that I am financial more robust than my rival. And then they fight. And if none of them are willing to give up, each round they will lose P2X I C2 <coughs> and <coughs> they will go to the government and ask them can you help us to collude again the government will say mm, we like that prices is equal to modern cost so that's beautiful for the consumers and then they go on fighting until one of them will go bankruptcy. Then it's all over. So this is a kind of market where <coughs> they have now one reason to stay at P1 because it's worth to go further down. And so far, in the textbook, there is one dimension that has not been discussed properly, and that is, in this context, innovation. Can there be one reason for the government, for the state, to help them to collude because of the effects from innovation. 
and I when we open to that and that is where I am going to have my research because I won a big project recently for the Ministry of Industry and that was to go through and evaluate all the measures to stimulate innovation. I'm going to do that evaluation project together with a big research institution in Oslo, Center of Statistics, and we are going to work with that in a few years period. But so far, I don't comment on innovation because I will do that when we come to that chapter in the textbook. And today, I just stop her. And the reason for that is that I'm just on leave from my hospital. I will go directly back. Have a good weekend.